We're here. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Quen's Day. This is where we're going to ask the questions and do the talking. So let's get going. People have already got stuff in the chat. If you're new here, just get stuff in the chat, and then I'll, I'll do my best to get to as many as I can. Betty, hi, everyone. Another Quen's Day. Hello, Betty. Yvonne, hey, how's Ireland? I hope you're doing well. Matthew Bush, aha, uh -huh, the return of this question. Hi, Curtis. While reading Paul, I came across a phrase that I can't remember the inner meaning of. It was something like, may it be meet with you. And Matthew's saying it comes from 2 Timothy, from Hebrews, from Peter. All those books are ones that Swedenborg doesn't give much internal sense meaning of. The epistles, as far as I know, unless he does it maybe in little fits and starts and places, but he doesn't talk about at length the internal sense of that. I think that that term, meet, it's like an old Englishy term for something like satisfactory. May it be meat and good for you. But I don't think Swedenborg has any commentary on those parts in particular. Now three, hey, how's Berlin? Thanks everybody for tuning in from around the world. Oh, and then Matthew Bush says, where can I find a list of correspondences? Well, if you go to, what, not that we're doing product placement or anything, but if you go to Swedenborg.com, there is a book that you can get there called the Dictionary of Correspondences by George Nicholson. There's no place in Swedenborg where he ever lists out any kind of dictionary of correspondences. It's always in the context of what he's doing. So, but that would be a good starting place, I would say. This is from Juan who says, Curtis, my first question. For Swedenborg, what is the meaning of Jesus's words about his yoke being easy? What kind of yoke is he talking about and why that specific term? My yoke is easy and my burden is light, is the quote. Yoke is something you put on oxen to keep them pulling some agricultural tool behind them. Swedenborg says we actually begin life under the yoke of hell. So we are jerked around by our passions and by the negative thoughts that accompany those. And that... Hell is constantly trying to mess with us and lead our life in directions that are destructive, and we are struggling against that. It's like we're under a yoke. God is contrasting that by saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, because really what we're trying to do is swap out being led by hell, which is being yoked by hell. Because if you're, an, if you're an oxen with a yoke on you, you can't go where you want to go, you have to go there. Two, being led by the Lord which might sound like, well, what about being led by no one? But you're always led by something. There's always desires and thoughts pulling you forward. And what God wants to do is give you God's yoke, God's leading is like, I'm going to let you, I'm going to reform your character in such a way that the things that you want are also things that are good for you. And once we're there, you can go wherever you want. But people who get in that state want to be led by the Lord. So there is this, yes, there's a partnership. Yeah, you're being led by the Lord, but it's this totally um, voluntary, joyful experience. Then Juan says, my second question, what did Swedenborg write about freedom of religion? Are you talking about freedom of religion, like separation of church and state? Or ecumenicalism. Everybody can follow what religion is right for them. And Swedenborg was remarkable in his day for saying that, yes, there's a heaven, and yes, Jesus Christ is God, but also anybody from any religion that lives a life of love of God and love of the neighbor can be in heaven right now and can then go to heaven after you die. Um... Swedenborg says that actually groups that we would consider in be, being in different religions can actually be in the same church. He describes what he calls the, mo the ancient church, which was a gathering of different religions or different groups with doctrines, but they were all united by the same spirit of charity. So they all had this, this prevailing love for the human race in them, and so, despite the fact that their doctrines differed, they were all the same church. 
which is funny because you when you first hear about the ancient church, you know how it's good. You when you were you know when you first heard about the ancient church, no, is that a Swedenborg nerd thing? But you think of oh, there was one, there was a church sometime that had some name like like Christianity today. But he says that if you if you research it, you'll see in different places he says oh they they had very different doctrines, but they still were one church because of the love that drove them. So it seems like there's freedom of religion all over the place. Which of the wild wood? What words of wisdom can I give a depressed person who is severely oppressed by false ideas, who has difficulty seeing the truth? They are self-hating thoughts, and he can't seem to break the cycle. That's a tough place to be in. And I, everybody's experience is different, but I've definitely had been in places that that, that description reminds me of. For me, the thing that helped is the idea of hell that those are not your thoughts. Those thoughts, what's, how is your mind going to manufacture clever, intentionally destructive, self-hating thoughts? That doesn't make any sense. So to me, the only the one way to really separate was to, th to give a chance to the concept that this thought is not mine, and actually it's from something that's trying to hurt me and, and something that is, is lying. Because hell only lies. Like it can only take, give falsity to go with its evil. That, that to me, it explains it. I mean, it because otherwise you can't push back and say, well, these thoughts aren't true. Because it, well, why are they there then? Isn't this my mind producing the best possible assessment of the reality that I'm in? You just, why would these be there? There must be some reason. There must be some truth in them. Until you can get a picture of, Who's sending these thoughts and the motivation for them? You can't break out of it. I know that with phone stuff, uh, almost every phone call that I get, I don't pick it up. And they'll see some message, and I can just even read the transcription, and it says, your student loans, the last chance. And I know that's not real because it's just a scam. It's a scam I've gotten a million times in a row. And if I didn't understand if I didn't understand that there were these whole scammer operations and that these are robo calls and, and why they're trying to do it because they're trying to get your credit card information and how that benefits them. And that, Oh, I have a, now I have a structure and a framework to understand this. Then I can really with confidence believe I'm just going to delete this. I'm not even going to listen to it. I don't need to, I, there's, there's nothing I need to worry about with my student loans. That's or car warranties. That's what hell is. It's just trying to get, it's, there's hell feeds on your misery. Hell is trying to get you to fall into a state of hell. And they, there's, there's no truth in what they're saying. Like the, the equivalent of, there's nothing I need to look up about my student loans or car warranty. They're not going to contact me over the phone. There's nothing that's wrong with you, person. God is in charge of who you are and where your life is going. Uh, and the self hate, God doesn't hate anybody, and God knows all of us better than we are. So the reality of it is that you're not detestable. So in, for me personally, until that hell piece came into focus, I couldn't break away from my own negative thoughts. Sorry that your friend is going through that. I hope that hope he can move out from under those clouds soon. What else we got? Is that all for today? I'm just kidding. There's a ton. There's a ton. Thank you so much. Mark Justy, hi Curtis. From a Swedenborgian perspective, what would you say is the value of prayer, and how one would one go about praying other than just reciting the Lord's Prayer? Thanks. I think prayer is important. I think prayer is good. Is good. Um, Swedenborg, I believe, directly defines prayer in one place as speech with God. The way that I've prayed most often in my life is just to talk out loud or in my head to God. I think that that's how I got comfortable doing public speaking and things is because I got so used to talking to God, just to like try to talk through things. I didn't hear anything back. <laughs> it's not like I was, God's like, let me, all right, well, I'll answer your questions, but it does something inside of you. So 
prayer is speech with God. I think there's some, there can be something effective about doing it formally, using the Lord's Prayer. But if you feel like you have to do that, it can make it kind of wooden and you kind of shut down into, okay, well, this is religious mode. I'm not really saying what's going on for me. So I would say you do what works for you. Definitely, if I'm needing to push back what I feel like is sort of negativity that's trying to close in on me, then I will often go to scripture and, and repeat it as many times as I need to try to clear that up. But the value in prayer is that God can give you spiritual things if you pray for them, I think. Physical things, if you, if like I, I need this video to be the best video I've ever made, <laughs> or I need uh, a car, or I need to win some award. All those things are in providence. I mean, you don't know what's the overall impact of any of those things happening and whether it will lead you toward or away from the spiritual goal God is trying to put you towards. So you wouldn't even probably want to... It's yeah, easy for me to say. It's If, if you really need something, if you're, if you're really hurting for money, and you need, it's hard to not ask for that. I don't think it's bad to ask for that. I just don't... Swedenborg doesn't say anything about the mechanics of that. And I would think God is trying to give you everything good that he can. But with spiritual things, spiritual things would be like insights into truth, feelings of love, um, humility, everything that makes heaven inside of you. Asking God for those actually can change, um, can, can get you results because those things are often dependent on, uh, can come in to you once you have humility. And having humility is part and parcel with saying, well, I need your help. It also is this acknowledgement that God exists. That there is, it can change your spirit to pray. As far as how, how much it affects other things, I don't know. Okay, cool. Let's see what else we got. Uh, hi, Isa from Austri Austria. Love Quitesh says, I have a question. If a person is being influenced by demons, how to tell and how to help them? Did Swedenborg believe in exorcisms? I don't think Swedenborg ever talks about exorcisms. He seems to say that demon possession, he does think it happened, but that it's something that happened in a, in a direct way, like you hear about in the Bible, but that doesn't, happen like that anymore. I don't know if that means it never happens. He talks about internal possession though, and that if we don't see anything wrong with evil things, if we, things that are bad, if, if we, if we don't really have any aversion to them, that's kind of like hell's in there. You're possessed in that way, which, okay, all of us are possessed in different way, different areas. So the way to get rid of that is to inspect those things in yourself, label them, you know, and you got to do it from what you really believe. Cause you can't just say, well, someone else says this is bad. It's gotta be a personal journey or else you just get this like religion is keeping guilt on you and you, you don't end up getting any closer to God or, or, or just messes you up. But if you get into those, those states of repentance and reflection, then you can tag those things and ask God to remove them for you and then resist the urge to act on them. But that's probably not what you're talking about, Love Gutesh. Um, how to help them? I wouldn't. I don't know what to do other than what I was just saying is to to have people learn about hell and how hell, what hell is like, and how it operates. That's what's been most helpful to me is to get go through Swedenborg's work and find out all the descriptions he has with hell, and people will recognize it if they feel like it's going on in their mind. That if if you, if Swedenborg can say, look, this is how. I think it's Secrets of Heaven 1820 or Arcana Celestia 1820. Uh, let's see if that's right. Yeah. Here's something. Um, is this going to have that in it? No. Secrets of Heaven 1820 has a good 
description of how hell works. There's a lot of other places. I would think that that's all I know. As far as other things, I, there may well be good things that people can do to get rid of bad influence, but I don't, Swedenborg doesn't give me any insight into that. So sorry that you're, the person you're asking about is, is going through that. Hope they're feeling better soon. Okay. Amber, when will you and Jonathan make music together again? I love that xylophone. Yeah, we got to bring back that toy piano. That's my daughter's. She's not using it anymore. She's too big now. Will says hi from Australia. All right, we're like lighting up the whole map here. Dominican Marine 129. Um, I have a good question. If God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, why does he allow hauntings to occur, especially ones like this one? And it's kind of an extension of if God is om omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, why doesn't he stop anything bad from happening? I think this is, and we're addressing this, in the series that we're currently publishing on Mondays. We have an eight-part series that I think we just put up the sixth part that is about God and evil. So I would first recommend go and watch those. In, in general, anything that's bad that is allowed to happen is because it prevents something worse and it, that it ultimately leads to good. So there is, people have, as I said, people have negative tendencies and they act on them. And every time somebody act, feels some, an impulse to evil and says, I'm going to do that because I want to do that, that messes up the, the world for everyone. That, that causes harm to them. It causes harm to the people they harm. It degrades the quality of divine order. And as that gets more and more degraded, the system breaks down and people have to suffer things. The way I understand it, e even stuff like premature death, like us dying young and things like disease, they all have their origin in hell. So God doesn't can't prevent all of that because the only way to get hell out of everyone is to allow, if you just bottled it up and didn't ever let anyone do things that are harmful, then it would never be seen and could never be consciously rejected from the heart, which is the ultimate antidote to evil. When I say diseases, I don't mean that if you, you have a disease, it's because you did something bad. What I mean is evil is the ultimate cause of all disease. Like the reason that there is sickness is fundamentally because there's a corresponding, corresponding spiritual sickness, human race wide. And now we're dealing with the consequences from it. Harry says, hello, Curtis. This is Harry from England. Can we eat and sleep in heaven? Yes. Uh, you um, you eat. He says it's it's actually it's actually this. It's a little bit confusing to me because he will talk. Swedenborg definitely mentions about mentions feasts and things in the afterlife. He talks. Oh yeah, he talks about a society in heaven and they have meals there. He also says, though, that, that goodness is the equivalent of food, that spirits don't need to eat in the same way that we need. They, what they need is goodness and truth, like we need food and water. So I think you eat, I don't know if like you experience the intake of goodness as eating, or if you can eat as more of a recreational thing or a symbolic thing, but it's something. Sleeping. Yes, Swedenborg talks about that people have bedrooms in their houses. He talks about spirits sleeping. Do angels sleep? We talked about angels having the day-night cycle. He talks. He goes through the day, uh, the order of events in a day in this particular society in heaven. So, generally, the things we do on earth we do in heaven, but in, in more perfect form and with a gr much greater variety and wonder. Does Swedenborg believe this is L. Bailey? Does Swedenborg believe in being born again, and was he born again? Yeah. To being born again is, in Swedenborg's view, a result, the, the end result of the process of regeneration, of reformation, 
regener- repentance, reformation, and regeneration. This is the work of spiritual growth that God is doing throughout our lives. All the hard stuff that is allowed to happen, like I was mentioning before, is only allowed if it contributes to this repentance, reformation, and regeneration inside of ourselves. So while you'll have some people who say being born again is like a momentary thing, you say a certain word, you get a ritual done, and then you're born again, you did it. To Swedenborg, being born again is a complicated, long, drawn-out process, but all the angels had been reborn. You get a new, you get a new will and a new intellect. You, you go from starting out self-centered and materialistic and end up with love of God, love of the neighbor as the main thing. And that is the process of rebirth. So I do think he was born again. I, I, you can never be just, you're all the way born again. You are continually being perfected forever. But I think that Swedenborg had a lot of spiritual work done, especially in in the time that preceded his writing these books that we're talking about. When he was doing his Journal of Dreams, he was undergoing some really significant regeneration. So I, I think to an extent, he was. All right. Mrs. S, is it possible to die and not know you're dead? Hey, I think we got this question last time. It's possible um, to forget that you've died. If you're really bent on being materialistic and self-centered, you can kind of block out everything that doesn't fit with the view of life that you want to have. But in general, the knowledge that you're dead is is widespread in the afterlife. There can be little periods where you kind of forget. You're more, more like when you're in a dream and you don't know you're dreaming. You can be like kind of heads down, just, just concentrating on what you're doing really in the present. But overall, people know when they're dead. Induja says, Hi, spirits don't have a body. So how can people hug their family members and friends in near-death experiences? You don't have a physical body, but your spirit is in the same form as your body. You have a spiritual body. The Swedenborg said that people sometimes think of spirits as just like a whiff of air or of thought or of emotion, but you can't have thought or emotion occur outside of a form. Just like your brain is a bunch of neurons and things in a certain position and in certain states, and that's what allows us to have these thoughts and, and emotions. And that your spirit has that same kind of structure. So everything spiritual in, in you has a form, and taken all together, your spirit has a human form. So you have the equivalent of your body, but a spiritual version. Your spirit looks like it has hands, has a head. Your spirit is not just connected to you at one point. It's connected to every little bit of your body and has that same form. So people in the afterlife, everything is tangible there. They have senses. They can see things. They can hug because you're hugging the spirit. The spirit is not made out of liquid or something. It's it's got form just like the human one does, except for it's made out of spiritual materials rather than physical materials. Dominican Marine says, that's not true because according to Swedenborg, angels come and visit you to tell you that you're dead. Yeah, that's how you know that you're dead. That's what I meant. I guess some people intuit it, but like right when you're waking up, angels say, you've died. And when Swedenborg would encounter people who, because of self-centeredness and materialism, basically antisocial minds were, were arguing with him about something like, in the afterlife, like there's no heaven and there's no God. And he would say, don't you remember when the angels told you that you are a spirit? And then Dominican Marine says, so God is allowing these beings that are dead to mess with these innocent people, which is messed up. If he's a God, why doesn't he stop these people from being haunted? Yeah. And I, I don't know people that have been haunted, but I'm sure that it can, that people can have really disturbing experiences and just like all negative things that are happening, I don't want to make light of it. I don't want to say, oh, because it's all going to be good in the end, doesn't mean it's good now. I'm not saying, oh, everything's fine, but that ultimately people who are suffering, in the end, they will be happier. 
and, and their suffering, God is using that to somehow continue their spiritual growth. I know that a lot of people who go through really hard things, I'm, I'm um, getting this speech ready where there's, I'm referencing this woman who is in this documentary called Black Tar Heroin. And she was one of six heroin addicts that was um, walked around and filmed in this. And she said that she was want, agreed to be in the film because she thought she was going to die soon anyway. And she wanted to just show people that being a heroin addict is not as glamorous as she thought it was and that it leads to all kinds of trouble. But she survived. And now she's a licensed addiction specialist and she wrote this book called the big fix on how to help people and she's doing all this stuff to help people who are in a situation where she like she was in and she knows that situation so much better because she went through it so everything that's harmful haunting whatever it is god is somehow going to use that to contribute to that person's happiness ultimately that the the trust you had to gain in god the the knowledge of what evil really is and not not wanting to be a part of it whatever it is somehow that's going to lead to your happiness more in the end that that all things will be god will wipe away every tear in the end it's not the ideal way we would things wouldn't have to be like this at all if there wasn't so much evil everywhere but god is making the best of the world that we've all chosen Okay, let's see what we got here. Sorry, I did the old skip down. We'll see. Where's everybody? What are they talking about? Mm-hmm. Okay, I think... I don't know if I skipped people or not, but more questions. Hopefully I got it right. This is Tema who said, I have a question if possible. Do we have the option of annihilation? I'm not very fonded with an eternal life or a long life after death. I hear you. There's definitely times when it feels like I can't do this forever. So, no. I, I know, when Swedenborg never talks about the idea that you could just say, I'm, I'm out. I opt out of life. I don't want to exist anymore. I hope you can't because, gosh, man, like the people that know you, that would be sad for them to lose you. I, I would hope that we get to the point where we wouldn't want to lose our lives, even if we could. Certainly, though, thinking about forever, it's hard for that not to seem like a burden. But it's not a forever of time. It's a forever of state. So if you just think about, the clearest way I can think about this is picture a time in your memory when you have really had a lot of good things going. And there's there's things that are developing that you're excited about and you're you just like you're working on some project or some relationship is going well or something and you just can't wait to, to do the next thing in it. Or even if you're like reading a good book or watching a good movie and you're excited to see the next part. Eternal life is like that. It's like you're, you're so into what you're doing and it's so balanced that you can rest when you need to rest and you are active when you need to be active that it's, you get into it. It's really like you get into such a state of living in the moment that, that it doesn't feel long. It just feels great. You're just excited and happy and satisfied by what you're doing. YouTube videos this is from Crash Organism. I'm addicted and a massive fan of people being genuinely wholesome. People and animals getting help when others do not know they are being viewed, not doing it for views. I there's there, that is so great. When you when you see that people are genuinely just being good, it's moving. And I think the reason is is that that's called love of God. Love of God is to love goodness because it's good. So I want to do this thing 
not because I'll get views or anything, but because it's the right thing to do. And I, and I love the idea of doing that right thing. That's, that's divine. And it's probably why when we see that coming from God through someone, it's awesome. Now three says, are there words to describe love? English is for me a school language, but even in my own language, how can we describe what love is? <clears throat> there, I would imagine that there's a lot to describe about it. I guess it would be kind of like, w describe life. Swedenborg even says that love is our life. But if you describe life, if you even look in the, the I think the dictionary definition of life is this long, complicated thing. Let me see if I can look it up here. Uh, life definition. Aha, life. Noun, the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. That's not a very good definition. It's just like we're going to lump a bunch of things together. I'm not saying that it's not good. The, that's the best definition that is way better than one I could come up with. That's the best definition based on looking at things externally, physically. But... As far as definitions go, it's like kind of circuitous. So I think love would be like that. There's so many aspects to it. Swedenborg does sum it up this way. At one time, he says, feeling joy in somebody else as joy in yourself. That is loving. The metaphysical definition of love, somehow love is the underlying reality of everything. And wisdom is the form it takes. So... There are words to describe love, but there's, there's lots. Swedenborg will say it's our life. He says that it's substance. He talks about it as an emotion that you can feel. It talks about it as a desire for a goal that you can have. So somehow it can be all these things at once. And um, there are pictures of it that we can see. Fire is a picture of love. It's a correspondence to love. So you can learn something about love by looking at a fire. Um, Warmth is a correspondence to love. So when you feel warmth, you can be learning something about love, but it's a great subject. Jet, hi, Curtis, question. Are there things Swedenborg has said to you that you have doubts about or think differently? Do you dare to doubt or do you assume that everything he has written is true? I think I dare to doubt. I think there's there's a qu quite a number of statements. Usually, it's around smaller things that where I think well, I don't think that's true. It doesn't really shake me at all <sighs> because I think on the whole, it's just it's packed with truth. Like it's it's I think it's the best overall picture of reality. I don't. I certainly like I'm I'm, I'm blanking on like particulars right now, but. If you took me through everything he said, I, I there's there's some places where he'll say things that scientifically, are, you know, ninety nine percent probability they're not really how it is. But they're usually not in any load bearing place in his theology. Like he's trying to throw out examples or something. But yes, I would dare dare to doubt. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think it's infallible. I just think it's the greatest concentration of truth that exists in any one single source. And it's just got so many bits of truth in areas that I just haven't found anything on anywhere else. So, um, Oh, I see, Jet, you said, if give an example. Well, well, he talks about life on other planets in the solar system. Or, to be fair, he talks about spirits that he talked to who were from planets in our solar system. And, well, I don't think there's, I don't think there's people living on those planets physically. There's all kinds of theories as to what that actually means and how he came to, but that would be, that would be the biggest one. So there you go. But, but I, I so I just think, okay, well, either he like misidentified where they came from or, or right, there's, People can, spirits can be associated with something or it, I'm like, okay, there's some reason it's not really central to what I'm getting out of it. What I'm getting out of it is his description of um, what's right and wrong. How do you conduct yourself? What is God like? And all that stuff keeps lining up and keeps showing itself to be true when I apply it to my life and in different ways. So 
stuff like that, it's not carrying the weight of it for me. So I'm, I'm holding it loosely. And not only that, but like, I bet for a lot of stuff that I've read that I do think is true, I probably have just like a really partial crude picture of what it actually means of what he's actually describing. So hopefully that answers that. Isa, how can I find my purpose in life? Everybody's purpose is to regenerate. I think the, 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 our purpose is to not do evil things because they're evil and try to follow God. And then from that, God can lead us into doing what's good. And, and I don't mean you wouldn't actively pursue, like if, if you were talking about career or something, you got to go out there and try it. And it is hard to feel content with life if you don't feel like you're being useful. But I guess to add to that search, if we can work in any kind of confidence that God is going to, is, is building up the skills in me to become the right kind of angel. Even if it seems a little chaotic, what kind of person are we being on the earth? What, what use are we serving? Ultimately, all that kind of pales in comparison to the work, the use that we're going to perform as angels forever. So somehow God has given you the skills and tools to be the kind of angel that you're meant to be. And it's a lot easier when you, you find things that you can do with your life that, that feel like they're, they're part of purpose. So I hope you find that soon. And in the meantime, though, trust that like, you can just look at everything that comes along as like, okay, God is building me up and to be a certain kind of, certain kind of angel here with that. Hey, John Mitchell, Power Ranger Princess. I used to watch the Power Rangers when I was little. Question, I have an entity that has followed me in many lifetimes. How can I heal the pain from this entity, heal my past life trauma, and transcend in love? The closer I move to God, the more I'm attacked. Well, Swedenborg does say that when God approaches, that's when hell attacks. Or the, or the God's presence, the presence of love agitates hell because hell is... Um, taking pleasure in evil, evil being the opposite of good, evil being destruction that harms the well-being of people. So when God comes closer, it agitates evil, and evil's like, I can't live in this environment, so it attacks us to try to keep us from doing that. I'm sorry for the pain that you're going through. Um, the, on the only power to do that kind of stuff comes from God. So the more that, that we ask God, like, will you help me with this? Uh, I, I'm just trust, trusting you to take me where I need to go. That's what gives us protection from hell. And healing, uh, yeah, healing from pain, pain is, is a whole other thing that I, I don't know. It would be too pr particular to your situation. But I, I just know for myself, there, when, whenever I'm under, feeling like I'm under attack, that's when I just have to recognize total dependency on God. And the more that I can try to do that, the better. But it's tough. I'm sorry that you're going through that. Hey, Michael from Germany. Irene says, is Muhammad a principle? If yes, what does he stand for? If not, why are, there, why are there many Muhammads spoken of in the true Christian religion? Uh, what do you mean is a pr principle? Do you mean like a prophet? Or, um, sorry, could you clarify that a little bit for me? Thanks. William Boyd said, hey, Curtis, tomorrow's my 64th birthday. Happy birthday, Nintendo 64. Teresa McQueen. Hi, Curtis. Did Swedenborg say anything about people with sociopathic personality disorder? Basically, people who from birth are unable to be empathetic or even sympathetic. What about their souls? Yeah. I was just reading today in Secrets of Heaven, Volume 1, where it was in the part where it's talking about Noah and the flood that says that he said God's mercy. Where is it? I think I got it. I think in my backpack, I've got this Secrets of Heaven with a bookmark, like right there. Man, 
Can you believe it's such good television? All right, just give me a second here. Just give me a second. Come on, little bookmark. You didn't fall out, did you? Come on, you little bookmark. This is like an interesting part, too. There it is. Okay. Um, okay, give me just a second. Give me a second. Uh, ah, man, maybe I'm not going to get it for you. I might have to do the old paraphrase. Okay, paraphrase. Uh, it's he was saying that the way that the Lord's mercy extends to everyone uh, has to do with their life in light of the heredity that they received from their parents. So all of us, all the things that we do, the choices that we make between what what is good or what is evil. Um, it all is, it's all looked at based on the kind of mind that we started out with. Nothing else would be, anything else would be totally unfair. And God is not like, look, like I'm going to see if you pass my test. God is, think about your mom. Think about your mom or your dad and how they, like in the moment that they've most f felt love for you. And want to protect you and that's that's what god is like so god is looking for any god is trying to give us the best life possible at every moment all the time that's what god is so yes if somebody has this condition where they can't feel empathy or sympathy and that was something they were just handed there's got to be some spiritual life happening in there but god is is working to give them a path to heaven that the universe exists to give everyone the path to heaven and give everyone the opportunity to take that path if they want it so there's no way that somebody with this disorder would be shut out from it i don't know if they have like stunted growth here and they have to make that growth on the other side and just plant the littlest rudiments here but um but yeah there's, there's nobody that is predestined to hell there's nobody that Swedenborg even says everyone is predestined to heaven. Things are set up to lead us to heaven. You have to consciously and purposefully, repeatedly choose the opposite to, to, to choose hell. And even then, God is still there right with you, trying to give you the best life in every second that you can have. So, Yvonne says, finding this channel has changed my life. Thank you. That's so great. Well, thank you for being a part of the channel. Okay, so we got like two minutes left. Gabrielle says, can a bunch of teenagers in heaven who want to have fun do things like the famous prank called flaming bag of dog, dog poop, putting poop in a brown bag and setting it on fire, then ringing the doorbell? <laughs> Are you allowed to do that? No. And this is why. Um... Because there's a bunch of teenagers in heaven who want to have fun do that. Heaven is a state of mind where doing something that harms someone is not fun. This is assuming, of course, that this is actually like, like let's say the dog poop prank is to someone who that it would actually hurt. And it's not like your friend and they think it's funny. Let's say it's actually done with malice. Like, this is fun for me to, to embarrass this person or something. That's called hell. When the pleasure of evil is felt as good, that's hell. So if you're in heaven, by definition, the things that are fun for you are the things that are fun for other people because joy in someone else is joy in yourself. That's loving. I don't think it means that you can't, that n nobody's ever like mischievous. But I think that anything evil there, it's not like, okay, we've got to hold ourselves back from doing what we really want to do and do this boring heaven stuff. There, like w stuff, hell is boring. People would say, well, why would we want to put that poop on someone's porch? What does that even, what does that do? You know, whereas here we're like, ha, that's funny because we got this heredity. So you can do it to your friend, I guess, if your friend says it's okay. But do you get what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Let's do the last one. Um, do you know the reason why near-death experiences sometimes contradict each other? Did Swedenborg address this? Okay, 
Um, no, he didn't address it because there weren't like the, the concept of near-death experiences wasn't around. He, although he matches up really closely with near-death experiences this is why Raymond Moody in his book where he coined that term had a section on Swedenborg. But I think the explanation of how the spiritual world works that would fit with discrepancies in near-death experiences is that one, the spiritual world is full of appearances. So things don't always seem as they are. It depends on what kind of light you're looking from and whether the light of heaven is there or not. That to the people, let's say in hell, for example, hell looks totally different to them than it does to angels. And the only when you get up to this like angelic, your mind's open to God and God is showing you the real nature of things, can you really see how things are? So that's one thing. So people could be seeing things from different perspectives or, you know, more or less clearly, more or less in the light of heaven. But also people have to be left in freedom to interpret what they, they see. And angels are not interested in telling you, you have to believe this or you have to believe that. So people can come out of this. There, there, it may well be that people in near-death experiences talk to some people that were mistaken or something. I don't know. There, there's some reason, but it ha would it probably be um, because of appearances. But also, it could be that sometimes people bring back a message that maybe isn't a hundred percent accurate, but will do good in the world, and so providence will allow this to happen because people are more their character is more that they'll accept this message even though it's not a total truth, but they'll accept it and it will lead them to heaven. Swedenborg talks about that, like different uh, religious doctrines that don't have as much truth in them, but will are suited to the character of certain people and will lead them to heaven. That's why they're allowed to exist. So maybe it's the same with near-death experiences. Hey, everybody. Sorry I missed a lot of your comments today. As always, you can leave them in the chat afterwards. Before I go, though, hey, don't forget, we've got the Off the Left Eye Experience 2022. Come and check it out. You can sign up. There's a link in the description or go to offtheleftdie.com and you can come hang out. It's from the comfort of your own computer. We're doing a deep dive on the spiritual world around us and how it affects us and how it influences us. So come on and check it out. We'd lo I'd love to see you there. I'm giving a talk. Jonathan Rose is giving a talk. Karen Charles is giving a talk. Chelsea Odner is giving a talk. Sheila Robinson Kiss the mental health expert who is an expert in Swedenborg as well is giving a talk. It's going to be really great. Cool. Thanks, everybody. And uh, talk to you later.